Good evening. Welcome to Hardfire. I'm Ronald Wick. I'm your host for a special two-part edition devoted to the controversy surrounding the attacks of 9-11 September 1. My guest tonight is Les Jameson of New York 9-11 Truth. He's a representative of the movement. He's been very visible in uh, airing his concerns about the uh, alleged official cover-up. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking him for having the courage of his convictions. We invited Jim Hoffman, a prominent conspiracy theorist, to uh, join us last month. At the last minute, he decided not to show. So we're very grateful to Mr. Jameson for being with us tonight. I'd like to begin mm -hmm. by just reading a short paragraph from the Skeptical Inquirer magazine, an article that appeared a few years ago by Susan Hack, a philosopher of science. The title of the article is Science, Scientism, and Anti-Science in the Age of Preposterism. I like that word. Mm -hmm. A hundred years ago or so, uh, C.S. Pierce, a working scientist as well as the greatest of American philosophers, distinguished genuine inquiry from, quote, sham reasoning. Pseudo-inquiry aimed not at finding the truth, but at making a case for some conclusion immovably believed in in advance and predicted that when sham reasoning becomes commonplace, people will look, quote, on reasoning as merely decorative, end quote, and will, quote, lose their conceptions of truth and reason. Now, you'll admit this is an mm -hmm. important concern. Mm -hmm. How do we judge mm -hmm. when we receive so much information from so many sources? Mm -hmm. How do we separate the wheat from the chaff? How do we know what to believe? Who is a responsible spokesman? Who's just blowing smoke? Sure, sure. Uh, I think that's an excellent uh, question and excellent quote. Uh, I would answer that by saying that in the case of the uh, destruction of the World Trade Centers and uh, uh, other categories of analysis of 9/11, such as the uh, the alleged hijackers, the uh, the events of that day with the uh, uh, four hijacking simultaneously and uh, the uh, stand down or the absence of air defense. All these kinds of categories, the 14 months it took until there was an actual investigation, uh, we can apply reasoning of the highest order to every one of these categories. And that's what um, most people in the movement have tried to do. And I think it's easily uh, identifiable uh, apart from those that are much more fringe or uh, uh, speculation. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, drew a distinction between pure speculation and uh, the products of yeah. reasoned inquiry. Yes. Um, there has always seemed to me to be a certain degree of incoherence in the presentation of many conspiracists. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to uh, read a quote that you gave, I believe it was to New York Magazine, and it made an impression on me, it got me thinking. You said, I read a story in Newsweek which said these generals were told earlier that, or told earlier that week not to fly. Obviously, someone knew. My reaction was wholly expletive deleted. Mm -hmm. This process has been one wholly expletive deleted after another. And I find that interesting because it suggests that you've gradually come around to the position you presently hold, that this is not something that emerged a full-blown like Athena springing from Zeus's forehead. Uh, when the attacks occurred, you, you had no problem uh, accepting the idea that Arab terrorists flew planes into the buildings? When the attacks occurred, I, like um, almost everybody, I would say, uh, was immersed in the, the, the shock and the trauma of it. But True. underneath it, I did have um, an intuitive questioning going on, which was, how in the world could our multi-trillion dollar intelligence establishment, the most sophisticated in the world with satellite technology and multi-trillion dollar software that monitors all kinds of communications, how could they not know? So that was my sense. And um, then a few months later, I was listening to uh, a radio show on WBAI, uh, gentleman by the name of Ralph Shulman at a show and that he had information that uh, really really opened uh, up, up the whole inquiry for me and then it proceeded from there and um, I just uh, so this is since November of 2001 I've been studying 
this. Yeah, I want to get back to this business mm -hmm. about the generals being warned. I mean, all right, we can touch, touch on the failures of American intelligence. We know that American intelligence has performed very badly, uh, particularly over the last decade. So um, any degree of incompetence that someone is willing to allege, uh, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I think they can miss lots mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. But again, can, can I, I just interrupt sure. you really quickly? Uh, the incompetence um, factor, though, has to really be studied uh, between the CIA and FBI agencies. And I think Apparently that. Apparently, there was a block, though, between the two of them. That they, they really, uh, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And that's the source of a, yeah, a lot of problems. That's what uh, we've been told. Although, CIA mm -hmm. analyst, uh, retired analyst Ray McGovern, mm -hmm has stated that, that uh, there are provisions in place for the heads of those agencies to actually communicate back and forth. Mm -hmm. So he said that it's always been in place for communication to take place. So that is not uh, uh, a good reasoning for there not being connections mm -hmm. uh, going on. And, uh, but furthermore, I just want to say in terms of the incompetence um, approach here, uh, it just doesn't watch. Just, just doesn't watch. There are far too many. Uh, uh, instances of foreknowledge, warnings, papers uh, around the world picking up uh, little instances of warnings, uh, and and uh, this went on, especially since 1995, I would say, and then the year of 9/11, three four months beforehand, it was just a, a multitude of warnings, and on top of that, um, FBI. Field agents went to uh, Attorney David Shippers, who was the second in charge of the uh, Whitewater investigation of Clinton mm -hmm. under Kenneth Starr. They went to him saying, We know of a plot happening, we have uh, specifics, and we have to do something to ward off this attack. David Shippers goes to John Ashcroft, G gets nowhere. John Ashcroft finally tells uh, FBI, Stop t talking to me about terrorism. Then, with the Musawi case, which uh, was a, uh, just a recent trial that was all, all over the TV and uh, newspapers recently, we had three field agents doing the same thing, saying, we have warnings about Musawi. He's uh, highly uh, suspect. We, we need to investigate him, get a FISA warrant. These were all blocked. Harry Samet was one of them, who sent 70 memos. This is all documented. It was in the, in, Every newspaper, the, mm -hmm. the big one, the Washington Post, the Times, you name it, they were all blocked. And one of them was even altered, uh, edited by, uh, I forget it was either Michael Maltby or, or Spike Bowman. These are uh, superiors within the FBI. Three of these superiors were then, instead of being fired uh, or, or reprimanded for negligence, or dereliction of duty, obstruction, they were mysteriously promoted. Oh, okay. Well, now let's get so. to the mysterious part. We have uh, extraordinary standards of mm -hmm. accuracy here on Hard Fire. So sure. the last thing I want to do is misrepresent your position. Yeah. We can state that you believe that there really are Islamic terrorists in the world who seek to harm America. I mean, you're not one of these people who say, well, this is all mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors. I mean, oh, no, know, no. I, I do. I do say that uh, there are uh, Islamists. Uh, Islamic e extremists uh, who are on uh, you know this whole extreme jihad idea uh, mm -hmm. that that this uh, ideology exists absolutely I say that in other words the attacks on the uh, Kobar towers the attacks on the American embassies in mm -hmm. Africa the attack on the USSR so these sure. are not false flag attacks uh, these, these well, are real things uh, well the the thing that has to be identified though is uh, what's behind the, uh, uh, the, the, the sources. The, we, we have to go back to the, actually the Mujahideen in the early 80s. We have mm -hmm. to remember our own CIA funded, trained, and nurtured the, uh, this group. And, on, only and Afghan Mujahideen. The, the Afghan uh, Saudis had their own funding. I mean, Osama would never take funding from America. He made that clear even at the time. There's this confusion mm -hmm. that the CIA funded Osama. Whether they tried and, to or not, mm -hmm. I'm not here to discuss, but yeah. Osama would not have anything to do with the CIA. Oh. He was never a I, CIA I stooge, as has been alleged. 
Um, he he we don't genuinely know feels the way about us yeah. that he claims to. That we he, could, that he we doesn't could, like us. That we could. That well, maybe he doesn't like us, but uh, for having bases in Saudi Arabia, of, yeah. at least allegedly from what we get from the news. But there also has been uh, evidence of CIA. Uh, uh, you know, collusion. I mean, he was even here in the U.S. Uh, under the name of Tim Osman. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's speculation. The, you know, everybody involved denies that. So oh, I, why, I, why should we believe that he's been here? I, I mean, he I, certainly wouldn't come here. He wouldn't want to come here unless he had a bomb with him. But, that, uh, I think if, I, if you, you gave know. me some time, I could come up with evidence. Well, that, yeah, it would be nice to track that yeah. down. But, I mean, uh, for now, no one in... No one in the government is willing to acknowledge that Osama has ever visited this country. The, the, big, the big thing about Osama, the most recent piece of news, which I have to tell you, um, is that somebody went to the FBI website to look at the list of the most wanted. See, where they, they have the pictures there. And Osama bin Laden was listed for the attack of the Kobard Towers uh, and nothing about 9-11. Hmm. So this gentleman calls up the FBI and speaks to uh, the, an agent by the name of uh, Rex Toom and asks, what's going on here? Why is that the, the, uh, the FBI does not list bin Laden in connection to the, the attacks of 9-11? And you know what he said? What? We have no solid documented evidence. You, you know, it's, it's possible that that reply was given because yeah. in my own dealings with the FBI trying to get statements from them and whatnot, they yeah. are notoriously closed-mouthed. Uh, they, they fall into this, uh, that's an open investigation, I can't comment on that, you know, uh, they're not terribly helpful. Uh, but getting back to your mm -hmm. quote, now when you say that these generals were warned not to fly, that suggests that the generals in question are not in on any kind of conspiracy. I mean, this is a vague warning. Uh, you certainly can't take any action on the basis of it. What does it mean not to fly? Stay off a plane for an indeterminate period until we tell you it's safe? Obviously, if there's someone pulling the strings, if there's an evil puppet master who knows that uh, we're going to fly jets into the World Trade Center, there's uh, no risk <laughs> to the generals. In other words, if you're part of the conspiracy, you can fly very safely. Just stay off the planes that well, are being well, flown into buildings. Well, they were obviously uh, being protected. And, and, uh, yeah, but so they, they why were, would this lead you to believe that there's some kind of conspiracy? It's a vague warning. I mean, why would you somebody, warn people who are in on the conspiracy? What no, would you be no, warning them about? No, uh, the implication here is not that they were in on this conspiracy, necessarily. It was the, the implication is that they, along with people like uh, John Ashcroft, mm -hmm. or, uh, Mayor Willie Brown, uh, author Salmon Rushdie, got warnings not to fly. And so, yeah, but so these again, Willie Brown says that this was a very vague warning. He's not even sure who it came from, and he disregarded it. Now, Ashcroft made the point that he does fly commercial aircraft, and uh, he didn't stop flying commercial aircraft. I believe he did. He went to private. Uh, the private. only time they fly com uh, private aircraft mm -hmm. is on some kind of official function, you know, that's been designated by the government as warranting a special plane. But uh, again, uh, well, I, I will cite 911myths.com often enough, but they, they have a chapter discussing this, this issue. And, I mean, uh, th doesn't it sound suspicious? So many warnings. Uh, there were there well, were the, other, the thousands of, of warnings. But I mean, I mean, to no, not not to fly for all, all these. But it's not clear that, that yeah. anyone in the government was told not to fly. In fact, people who are asked yeah, about it keep denying it. They say, no, we, we just kept flying. It's, no, I, it's clear that they, they were warned not to fly and cancel flights. According to Newsweek, uh, these, these Pentagon officials did cancel flights. So then flights. these people can't possibly be in on any kind of conspiracy. There's, there's no implication that they were in, but, okay. but whoever they were warned by. So now what I'm trying to do is mm -hmm. to make a distinction mm -hmm. between the people who think that, uh, you know, this evil cabal of neocons uh, connived mm -hmm. in allowing the World Trade Center to mm -hmm. be destroyed, which is, you know, one position. But then further down the spectrum, I would say a far more preposterous position, uh, there are people who contend not merely that the Bush administration allowed the attacks to occur, mm -hmm. but rather that they perpetrated them. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're perpetrating this unprecedented crime, the conspiracy is simply enormous. I mean, it, it, it spans several branches of government, uh, the aviation industry, 
uh, air traffic control, uh, the Defense Department, mm -hmm. uh, all the military branches involved. Not necessarily who's, all. Who is involved in yeah, the conspiracy? Yes, yes. In well, first of all, let me tell you sure. what sort of conspiracy sure. are you promoting here? In other sure. words, you don't think the Bush people masterminded the attacks? Um, I would say it's it's difficult to uh, say across the board. You know, the whole cabinet was involved uh, or in masterminding. But who would I, I would know say about, I would say who that would know about this. Well, I, I believe uh, Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Rumsfeld would know, as as uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, Richard Myers, I, I think, would know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these were people who were kind of missing in action uh, that morning. And uh, although Dick Cheney was uh, whisked away to the Presidential Emergency Ocu uh, well, that's Operations that's Center, protocol. you know, and uh, in there, though, we when he was there, he was monitoring what was going on with the uh, uh, the flights and. Uh, uh, Norman Mineta testified that he was there at, I believe, it was 9 10, uh, which is a contradiction to what Cheney said. Yeah, I just posted this testimony yeah. on a libertarian yes. Yes. Uh, uh, discuss list. Uh. Where, where there was a, a staff member coming mm -hmm. in saying the plane is 50 miles out, then comes back saying it's 40 miles, then 30 miles. Does the order still stand? Well, the impression that Mineta left, or the impre what he stated, was that you've got people here who are confused and who don't really know what's happening, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, when uh, Cheney says to him, uh, have you heard anything contrary? Yeah. Meaning, yes, the order still stands. What order? To do what? Uh, the Pentagon is the most heavily protected building, probably, in the universe. Okay. Actually, it's not. And, uh, there, there's no battery of missiles around the Pentagon. They, yes. Maybe there should be, but no, there isn't. No, there are, uh, we know they have posted batteries there on special occasions, but they're not there routinely. Uh, a gentleman by the name of John Judge who grew up, his parents were in the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, and would go to lunch you know, at mm -hmm. the Pentagon, would talk about sitting there having lunch, and uh, there would be battery. A miss anti-missile battery right there. His father, who worked there, told him, You're, th don't, don't touch that. That's a, a missile battery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the Pentagon. They, I mean, he could have seen a missile battery from time to time, but they're not routinely posted there. There's no Pentagon missile battery. That's just, you know, you bring in a battery of, of air defense missiles for whatever reason they decide. But it's, it's you not... You think they're there they're, they're permanently? That's, that's what the Pentagon has stated, that there is no permanent missile battery guarding the Pentagon. But, you know, this, this uh, leads us into an interesting area because uh, the whole question of shooting down commercial airliners. Mm -hmm. and I, when I first heard someone say, well, why didn't they shoot them down? I said, who on earth would give that order? In other words, the, the people who are screaming the loudest about why weren't the planes shot down would have demanded Bush's impeachment if they had been shot down. No plane had ever been not, flown into a building. We why? don't know. We How don't could know we that. justify we, we, shooting down a commercial airline oh, over a metropolitan area? Because it, it could be judged the lesser of two evils. Uh, That's what allow. it would be. But yes, nevertheless, yes. the people who would, de you know, who hate Bush, who think that Bush cannot be right. You know, if Bush comes I mean, out against cancer, I, I, they have I to say a good word for the disease. Uh, that would be probably uh, easily defendable. It, it's a choice of either shooting it. A plane down or letting it crash into the, the, the How ca do you know capital. It's going to crash into a building. The capital, because of uh, the uh, tra trajectory. And a plane is hijacked, and Michael Moore says, "Oh, the poor darlings meant no harm. They were intending to take it to Cuba to the workers' paradise. You know, how could you shoot them down? Uh, You're uh, savages. These poor people I, I are just making a I, statement." I, I doubt that. I doubt that. <laughs> and it's a little hy hyperbole. All anyway, right, but what, you see what I'm saying? That no one uh, who is asking Bush to shoot down a, p a plane would not have demanded his impeachment if they, he had authorized it's, it. It's, it's absolutely protocol that in the event of a hijacking. Uh, that there's a decision-making process if there needs to be a shoot-down of a commercial jet. Yeah, but the, the, the point so. is if you read the various transcripts from mm -hmm. NORAD and NEADS, uh, the Northeast uh, Air Defense System, mm -hmm. the, everyone's pushing it one step up a ladder. No one wants to take the decision for, oh, well, we'd better shoot down this airline. And there are 200 people on it or 70 people on it or whatever. Who wants to say, yeah, bring it down? Nobody. Well, Everyone's going to ask for clearance what's one interesting, step above. What's interesting is that uh, there was a change in protocol in July of 2001 in which 
the actual decision-making process ended at Donald Rumsfeld. Hmm. That's a suspicious point. I yeah, mean, but by the time you get to Rumsfeld, it's too late to act. See, this is another problem with the stand-down business. I don't know about that. He's, he's uh, the Secretary of Defense. Everything uh, should be live communication. Uh, well, I mean, let's, let's run through the procedure. Yeah. The, the hijackers turn off the transponder. Mm -hmm. Now you've got 4,500 blips to sort on your radar screen. At a certain point, it takes a few minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, whatever, someone at air traffic control says, we have lost contact with this plane. Did it crash? Is there a mechanical failure? Was it hijacked? Well, we don't the, know what happened. The, the protocol, of course, uh, and this has hap happened uh, 67 times in the prior year. Within minutes, any time a plane was seen going off track, uh, the fighter response would be right there. Oh, no, no. Uh, that's, that's on 9-11 myths. That, that number, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. It would take 10 to 15 minutes at best to get an order to Langley or Otis, just no, asking would, them to scramble. 10 to 15 minutes? Do you know how long it took them to intercept Payne Stewart's jet? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't even out of Florida. It was an hour and 20 minutes before F-16s intercepted Payne Stewart's jet. It, I've seen 76 minutes in some case. I don't want to be pinned down to the minute, but it was over I an think, hour and I, a quarter. I, think I have to, have to defend I mean, that. Oh, I, I certainly uh, what I read advise is you to check me it, on that. It, was, uh, it crashed finally in my, Wyoming. Yeah, it took by the time over it was, an hour By, by the time it was out of Florida, mm. there were jets there. No, no, they, they didn't even know that they had run and, out of oxygen. And uh, so, no, I, I, I again, I'm check, check 911. Also, also I'll that. say uh, Colonel Bob Bowman, who is a uh, former uh, fighter pilot who worked uh, with these types of operations with NORAD, said that if nothing had happened that morning, in other words, like no um, interference of any way, the the, the these planes that were hijacked or diverted, however, whatever happened to them, would have absolutely been intercepted. And this is coming from a man who flew on uh, a hundred and something missions uh, in Vietnam, and uh, he was head of Star Wars during the 70s. Yeah, but what Bowman is saying is contradicted by air traffic controllers and the people who work the air bases. They say that now things have changed. Now they have a, a much more rapid response in place. Yeah. But at the time, to go through the channels where the air traffic controller has to inform his supervisor after first determining that a transponder has been turned off and there's no contact with the plane, the channels involved, you're going to be 10 to 15 minutes until the Air Force Base is notified that they so, can't find a plane. Ron, but you're telling me that it takes longer now? No, now it's quicker. Now it could be done much quicker. But, uh, the, okay, the time of 9-11, you're telling me it was longer from then when Bob Bowman was... Uh, no, I, I simply dispute what Bob Bowman is saying. Uh, I don't dispute it. The, the people I'm, I'm citing dispute it. You know, there's always this problem when, mm -hmm. when someone is a, a talking head, you know, he's, he's making pronouncements on science and military matters, and mm -hmm. there should be a little disclaimer on the bottom of the screen. This person really doesn't have any expertise here. So when I give you a scientific opinion or a military opinion, I'm relying on sure. people who have more expertise than sure, I, who sure, are better sure. informed. I mean, I, I uh, Dr. Frank Greening has a dispute with uh, th Dr. Thomas Eager. Mm -hmm. I'm not the man to adjudicate it. Well, let's adjudicate uh, this one-minute clip that I brought showing a squib. So we have some physical evidence here that uh, is pretty uh, uh, convincing, I would say. Would that be the elusive giant squib? <laughs> you mean squid, not ah. squib. My mistake. <laughs> Do you still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen bursting from the buildings 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 And here.
Well, that was pretty clear. Uh, well, I think that was a lot more than just uh, pressure coming out of there. Well, actually, I'm, I'm astonished because that's the clip that I wanted to show. So uh, the reason I wanted to show it is that most people who see it feel that it simply destroys the notion that there were explosives in the buildings. I mean, you see this enormous cloud of dust. You see the buildings start to collapse. And then you see a plume, plumes, right. of ejecta emerging from the buildings. Now, apparently, everyone connected with demolition says this is exactly the opposite of what a controlled explosion would look like. Instead of this, uh, this flow of air that starts out softly and expands into a plume, an explosion would be an immediate cloud of debris that would actually lessen. I've, I've, I've seen a video from commercial demolition companies mm -hmm. that look exactly like that. The very soft plume? I mean, that, that wouldn't well, make sense they, because nothing's being expelled. I mean, air is being compressed yeah, and it's being yeah, forced out because yeah. there's nowhere else to go. Well, the big one uh, that we see coming out of the uh, maybe 20, 30 floors below is anything but soft, I would say. And uh, when you look at video of commercial demolitions, how they fall, free fall, the uh, speed of gravity, you see uh, the puffs going out all over the place, um, going s straight down symmetrically into its own footprint for the most part. Uh, all those categories, uh, there have been 10 or 11 categories actually identified uh, that are indicators of controlled demolition, and these towers met every one of them. Well, actually, uh, the Loiseau family, uh, Controlled Demolitions Incorporated, the largest uh, explosives yes. company in the country, they described the theory that explosives brought down the World Trade Center as, quote, ludicrous. Now, <laughs> uh, I've never blown up a building. I have no plans to. But if they say it's ludicrous, why, why should I dispute them? They would have to say it's ludicrous because they also got the contract to do the cleanup of the building. Controlled demolition, very uh, interestingly, it was a c company was contracted to clean up the debris at the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City and also in the World Trade Center. Okay, now we, we've got a perfect lead-in for next week's show. I don't want to keep you on tenterhooks, but I told you this is a two-parter, and we will resume in one week with the squibs. What were they? What do they mean? Thank you for joining us tonight, and my thanks to Les Jameson. But we'll see him again next week. Thank you, Ron. Every